now about that incredible story that we've heard about Jesus entering into Jerusalem. And as we begin, I've got a little activity for you. So in a moment, not just yet, but in a moment, on the screen will be four images. They're logos. And as the logos come up onto your screen, they are specifically designed to have a hidden symbol within them. So as they come up on the screen in a moment, I'd like you to take a few moments with the person next to you, look at the four images and see if you can spot what the hidden symbols are within it. So we shall see. We're just going to wait for a moment. We might even do a drum roll for them coming up on screen. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Poor pressure on the ABT. Lovely, there we go. And the next page, uh, slide for me, please. Thank you. Okay, so in a moment, off you go. All four pictures will come up now. Have a little look for what you can see within there. Oh, it's coming, it's coming. There we go. Going to give you a couple more moments. I still see some puzzled faces. Some of us have spotted some things. <laughs> okay. Right, well, let's see. Let's see how we did. We're going to go through each of them in turn. So the first one, Hope for African Children's Initiative. Anyone want to call out what you can see in that image there? Yeah, Samuel? Two people. Let's have a little look. Well done. So we've got in the negative space, you've got the outline of Africa. And then if you look at it, you've got a face of an adult and a child. Give me a thumbs up if you got that right. Ah, oh, good, well done. Okay, the next one, the Tour de France. Oh, we got the answer straight away. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much. So we have got there. If you know what the Tour de France is, it kind of gives it away, but the image does too. Tabitha, what can you see in there? Oh, he's bending over. He's actually riding something. Have a little look and see if you can spot where he's riding. Sophie. He's riding a... A bike, well done, he's riding a bike. So we've got him bending forwards, the yellow circle is the front wheel, the black and white circle is the back wheel. Now let's see, how about our Toblerone? Anyone spot anything before we give the answer? Anyone spot anything, Danny? There's a bear in the mountain, let's have a little look. There is, there's a bear, look, that way, standing in the white space there. Now, it's probably hard to see with yellow and white. Sorry about that. And then, gold star to anyone who got this one. It took me forever. FedEx. Anyone spotting? I've got two, three hands up with FedEx. Four hands up, five hands up. Oh, some people at the back. Bethany, shout at me. There's an arrow between the E and the X. Let's have a little look. There is. Just going in that direction. <laughs> now, some of you might be like, that's a happy accident. <laughs> but it's not. In actual fact, each of those are there for a very deliberate reason. I think we can kind of work out what some of them are. So Hope for African Children Initiative, we've got Africa there, and we've got adult and child, so that makes sense, that hidden message there. Tour de France, as we said, is a cycle race, so we've got the bike there. Toblerone is based in Switzerland. And Bern is where it originally came from, so their image, their iconography is a bear, so that's why there's a bear in there. And FedEx is all about taking your message forward, and so that's why they have the arrow there. So hidden symbols. Today, we're thinking about Jesus entering into Jerusalem, 
And the story is peppered throughout with hidden symbols and not so hidden. They might be hidden to us, but at the time, they were not so hidden to those people who were there. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds with the person next to you to think about the story that we listened to earlier and to think if you know, oh, I know why that was there. That was a symbol for something else. Or if you're absolutely new to it, you're just like, I've got no idea. Think about what is it that's in the story that might be significant. So 30 seconds with the person next to you. Any hidden symbols in the story we've heard? And if you're at home, please feel free to do this with the people around you. Okay, I'm hearing certain things that I stand here about certain animals. I see people doing certain gestures. Okay, we're going to round up, wrap up that conversation and we'll see how well we've done. So, let's have a little think then. So our first image is going to come up on the screen. So anyone think that there's any kind of significance to Jesus and a certain animal? Put your hand up if you think there might be some significance there. Some of us have got our hands up. Anyone want to kind of throw out an idea as to why Jesus chose a donkey to ride upon? Sarah? Sarah? Oh, you get the gold star. Fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah. Yeah. Love. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so there's the fulfillment of a prophecy. So in Zechariah in the Old Testament, 550 years before this event took place, Zechariah said that, Behold, your king will come to you, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt the young of a donkey. And we have there a fulfillment of a prophecy of Jesus coming and entering on a donkey. But in there, you might have heard the word humble. You'll hear him humble. And lots of people think it was a humble act to ride on the donkey. In fact, it wasn't. That's why it turns it round on its head. The fact that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, number one, um, well, number one, he rode in. That's first point. Normally, if you're on a pilgrimage and it was Passover and everyone was coming into the city, if you were coming into the city on pilgrimage, you would walk. So the fact that he came riding is, number one, a sign that something significant is happening. The fact that he chose it to be a donkey was the fact that it referred back to King David. King David, in 1 Kings, when he was really poorly, he was coming towards the end of his time on earth when he was there. He knew that he had a job to name his successor to name who was going to be king after him. And so he took his mule, it was a mule, and he placed his son Solomon upon it and rode him throughout the city, claiming, this is my son and he will be my successor. So to be upon a donkey was to be seen as to be the son of King David. And so when he was coming in and Jesus was sat upon it, he was saying, I am a prince, I'm a son of the king, and I am the son of David. And everyone there would have known all the hidden symbols within that. If he is saying he's the son of David, what he's saying is he's the Messiah. He's the one that is called to come and to redeem and save. But not only that, Jesus actually says, on a colt, an unridden donkey. Now, if you also know your Old Testament Hebrew history, because who doesn't, um, if you know that, you would actually know that for sacrifices, you would choose an unblemished animal, a perfect animal to represent you and to be sacrificed in your stead. But depending on the sin, on the thing that you'd done wrong, depended on the animal that was chosen. 
Now, a red heifer was highly regarded, so like a cow, and it had to be unused and never had a yoke upon it. So it had to be an unworked animal in order for it to be a sacrifice for one of the greatest sins, which was murder. And so, to ask for an unridden, unyoked, unworked animal was a holy symbol. It was saying this is a special holy moment that is happening right now. So not only is Jesus riding, but he's also on an animal that says, I am the son of David. And it's also on an unridden, unworked animal saying, I am holy. This is a holy moment that is taking place. So it links to the religion. Now, we've also got next picture. Thank you, Lucy. We've also got the palms. Now, it's only in John do we hear that it's palm leaves that were taken down. All the rest say leaves. But palms are specifically mentioned by John for a good reason. Whenever something's mentioned, you know it's for a reason. (laughs) Now, palm leaves, when they were waved, they said there has been a victory for the nation of Israel. So it meant a victory to the nation of Israel to wave a palm leaf. And then, not only that, John, the same person who mentioned it in his gospel, is also the one who had the the vision in Revelation. And John saw a picture of a great multitude waving palm branches, a victory for the nation of God's people. And so when they've got them waving their palms, that is such a symbol that there's a victory. In fact, to them, a victory has happened. You would wave it because someone's coming back from battle. A royal king is coming back from battle and has had victory. And so we wave our palms and we place them on the ground. And the other thing we have there is the cloaks being laid down too. So the cloaks being laid down, a bit like we would think of it as a red carpet, something for someone to walk upon, a stately entrance. But also, you would do that if a king were returning from battle and was victorious. So it marries up with the palm leaves. I'm laying down my cloak so that my victorious king can walk upon it. That was what that was symbolizing. And lastly, you've got the Hosanna, the crying out of the crowd, all shouting Hosanna. Thank you, Lucy. And that was an important word too. That goes back to the Old Testament again, to Psalm 118, when it says of David calling out after a victorious battle, would you believe it? And he's calling out, and Hosanna is spoken But Hosanna doesn't mean victorious battle. It doesn't mean praise the Lord. It doesn't mean alleluia. What it means is save us. That's what it means. And it actually comes when you look at the Hebrew, it comes from yesh hashana. And then from that, if you whittle it down, you get Hosanna. If you say it enough times and change it enough times, it comes to Hosanna. But yesh hashana also is filled with a lot of importance. Yesh meaning save or help. Hashanah, come and do it. So what they're saying is come help us. But the yesh in yesh Hashanah is also the yesh in Yeshua, which is also the yesh which turns into Joshua, which turns into Jesus. So the word Jesus actually comes from the yesh from yesh, which is made into Yeshua. (laughs) We're giving you a lesson on this at the end, see how well you're listening. But what they're actually saying is, Jesus, Jesus us. Jesus, you who are the saviour, come and do what you're called to do. Come and be who you're called to be and come and do it now. And that's what they were crying out. And did they have a clue? I don't know. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've said something and thought, where did that come from? And that wasn't like it was, oh, where did that come from? That was like, who just said that? And that's because God is speaking And so if the crowd are saying, Jesus, Jesus, our saviour, save us, come help us, you can understand why the city went, whoa, this is a moment. This is a moment. We have got this incredible king, son of David, coming towards us. We have got this moment of a victorious battle 
And we have got this saviour coming to our city. And the crowd in response go wild. So wild we hear that the stones themselves were saying, do you know what part of me just really wants to hear that? I, I want to hear, I know that sounds weird, I want to hear creation. There we go, I want to hear creation singing. In fact, I believe it does, but do we hear it? I wonder that creation will sing, saviour, saviour us. So we have got there an incredible hidden symbol. Now, I'm going to skip the next bit, guys, and move on to the bit after that. I wonder how you are with expectations. Have you ever had something so exceed your expectation that you've been blown away by it? Has there ever been a moment when there's been such an expectation it's not been met? that you've grown so disappointed and disheartened. Now we have got a crowd on Palm Sunday, on that day, welcoming Jesus. Welcoming him in. And they have got their palm leaves and they're crying out and they're worshipping Hosanna to the son of David. And their expectations are super high. Like skyrocket high. Their expectations is, this is it. He's here. The person we've been waiting for is finally coming. He's coming into Jerusalem and he's going to sort it all out. And the Pharisees knew it as well. They knew it. Keep them quiet. Keep them quiet. And if you read in the Gospels, for what will happen if people start to believe what he's saying? Because if you believe what he's saying, then he's just about to come and rescue. He's just about to come and save, and he's just about to turn things around. And their expectations were, great, get rid of the Romans. Get rid of this time when we're in lockdown. Get rid of this time when we are kept captive. Get rid of this time when taxes are so hard that we can't possibly pay them. Get rid of this time when there's battles going on. Get rid of this time, Jesus. You're going to turn it around, and you're going to get rid of all the Romans and doing it. And that's what they expected. Their expectations were here. And what does Jesus do as soon as he comes into the city? He goes straight to the temple. He goes to his palace because he is the son of David. He goes to the temple. And when he goes in there, instead of finding it praising God, he finds people ripping people off and turning the place of prayer into a den of robbers. And so he turns the tables over. And do you know what? I think the crowd's going, yes, come on, Jesus. You're doing it now. And then that evening, he goes back and stays with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And next day, he's in the temple, and he talks, and he tells them about parables. And then he goes back and stays with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And then the next day, And we get to the point whereby this expectancy of what God is about to do through Jesus was so high that it wasn't met. Jesus did not come and annihilate the Romans. He did not come and live up to the expectations of those people there who were once crying out. Do you know why? It's not that God didn't live up to their expectations. He didn't lower himself to theirs. He didn't lower himself to their expectation of just getting rid of the Romans. He was like, yes, I'm coming to save. Yes, I am the son of David. Yes, I've won a back victory. But my victory is a different shape to your victory. My way of winning is on a cross. My way of winning is rising to life again. And it will bring victory to the people of God. But my victory is not just for a nation, it's for all people. And so God did so much more than their expectation could ever, ever have thought possible. He was far greater than their expectation. And he was doing exactly what he came to do. It's just the people just didn't see it. They noticed the symbols. They knew this was a pivotal moment. Something special was happening here. 
but they thought as far as their imaginations could take it. Rather than saying, God, you are God. I'm not God. I know you are, and I know your compassion is far greater than my compassion. That your heart for the nation is far greater than my heart for the nation. That what you want for my friend who is suffering is far greater than what I want. That what you want for this whole global stuff that's going on right now is far greater than what I want for it. God, would you be God? And would you come and do what only you can do? And in my response, I lay down my cloak. I lay down every expectation I have. I lay down everything that's on my heart, everything that's breaking my heart, everything that's going on in the world and in my family and in my friends and in the city and in Pearly, all those things, I lay it down before you. Because even my greatest expectation is nothing compared to yours. And the hardest thing is to be disappointed by God. But that's because we're putting our expectations on him. We cannot disappoint God. I'll say that again. We cannot disappoint God. Because to disappoint someone, they have to have overinflated what it is that you're going to do. But God knows us. He created us, sees our heart, and knows what we're going to do. And therefore, you cannot fall from what he knows of you. He knows you, so you can't disappoint him. We can mess up and do wrong. Don't get me wrong. We can do the wrong thing. That doesn't mean he's disappointed in us. He goes, you know what? I've done it. I knew you were going to do that, so I've done it. I've done it. The expectations for him to do what he only can do. And so we're going to have a moment now of response. A moment to lay before God what it is that we want to say, Lord, would you come into this situation? And although it's the hardest thing to do, I'm going to say, let you be God in it. And I can pray, absolutely. I can pray all those things into it. I can pray, but the best prayer I can say is, your will be done. So we pray, whatever it is, I could tell you, God, what I think you should do. (laughs) And sometimes he says, yes. Sometimes he says, not just yet. And sometimes he says, not like that. So we offer it up to God for him to answer that prayer as only he can. And so coming round now, we have got some cloaks for you. They look like this. And at home, if you want to grab something that represents clothing, like a jumper or something, you can do that. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend a moment just thinking about what is it that I want to lay before Jesus and say, come, son of David, come, victorious king, come, holy Messiah, and do what only you can do in this situation. And so you might want to write something on there. There are pens as well. You might want to write it with your finger so no one can ever see it. God can. You might just want to think about it. But we're going to spend a moment in a minute just taking some time to reflect what is it that we want to place on our cloaks. And I'm going to invite the band just to play quietly. And in your own time, I'd like to invite you to come and lay your cloaks down on our path here. So come, Holy Spirit. Would you come and be with us now? And we place on here all that's on our hearts at the moment, all that we are going to offer to you, and know that you can do far much more than even our greatest expectation.
and in your own time. If you've written that, you've thought about it, it can be completely blank if you want, but you know what's on there in your hearts. Then do feel free to come forward and place your cloak down. And let's just take a moment. Oh, Heavenly Lord, we thank you that you rode magnificently and victoriously and humbly into Jerusalem with your eyes fixed on what it was that you were to do to free us all. Lord, we place before you all that's on our hearts and minds right now. We offer it to you saying, come Messiah, save us and walk upon this cloak we place before you. And as a response to your goodness, knowing that through cross and resurrection and ascension that you are with us now, we worship you in thankfulness. Amen. Amen.